Hi, I'm Chris. I'm Jolene. I'm Carter. I'm Shay. And I'm Caleb. And we're, we're the Wandering Naps. It's been six months since we moved aboard our boat. Today, we want to share with you the seven things that we've learned since living aboard. So here's the story of the Wandering Naps. We are a family of five from Texas. Chris and Jolene met in second grade and began dating our freshman year of high school. We got married in college, moved to Texas, had three boys, fell in love with the water, sold everything to travel the Caribbean. Join us on our adventure. Number one, we have learned that organization is a must. Everything in its place and a place for everything. In a small space, clutter can form quickly. Keeping things organized is a must. Less cabinet space means that we have to use this space efficiently. No longer can we just toss it in. It also means that we have to use what we have. No more holding on to things. Number two, <laughs> there, you will always know what body function everyone else on the boat is doing. From being sick to sandy toes to farts and poop, it all must be discussed openly. In a small space, there's lots of new ways to function. Guests take a lesson in what can be flushed and how to flush, as well as we have vents to allow airflow in each door, which means we invest in room fresheners. Oh, and did I mention we have one shower? We waste so many resources on the land, like toilet paper. <laughs> Water, power, packaging, garbage, and plastic. We are much more aware of these days of what we use, and we are always looking for ways to conserve. We are intentional with our water usage, our power usage, and we no longer use plastic bags from the store. Number four, everything takes longer on a boat. We no longer have all the same conveniences that we had in our home. We have no dishwasher, we use propane for our stove and oven, we hang our clothes to dry, and we have to either make water or fill with water. And we always have to make sure that our black water tank is empty every few days. Oh, and the maintenance. We won't even get into maintenance. Getting groceries also involves either a dinghy ride or a long walk to the car, and then returning with all the groceries always involves all of us in an assembly line. Learned how to do the boat dance. In a boat, we have a lot less space than we used to in our house, so we do the boat dance. The boat dance is learning to be patient. It's waiting your turn. It's you move, then I move. Number six, you realize the boat is always moving. Obviously, we live on the water, and water moves. So we're constantly checking the winds, the tides, we have to check the lines, we get seasick sometimes. We always have to make sure if there's heavy winds that we check the canvases and the bimini top. And we are also always latching doors open or closed. And finally, number seven. A full schedule does not equal a happy heart. Words cannot express what our family has gone through in these past six months. We left our home in Texas in search of growing deeper, living more, and experiencing all that we can from life. We have just begun, but we are slowly letting go of the American dream of debt, of overscheduling, anxiety, and the hustle and bustle of busyness. We have experienced more joy, more time with each other in this new journey. And we have seen so many incredible things that we will remember for a lifetime. We pray for you and your family to enjoy your journey. 
wherever you may be and wherever you may go. Make the most of it. Sit back and enjoy time with each other and enjoy the sunsets. So we asked on social media if you had any questions for us about what it's like living on a boat. We got a ton of questions and a ton of responses. So we'll go through as many as we can in this video. And if we don't get to it over the next couple of videos, we yep. hope to answer a couple of your questions. Just keep dropping those uh, videos in the uh, videos. Keep dropping the questions in the comment section of our videos, and we'll do our best to answer those over the next few videos. Yeah. Give an eyelash. They can't see that. I know. Okay. I can see it. Okay. Um, our first question we're going to answer is from Phil Friedman on Facebook. He talked about how he has had a boat in the Keys and he's run aground on almost every one of the Keys he's ever been to. And he asked if we can match that running aground on each of the Keys that we've been to. No. And that's not a goal we have. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we have touched ground... We're behind Lincoln Valley State Park, which is just south of us here, just going through a channel. It, it um, was a little bit different shaped and didn't quite follow the curvature of the... Uh, but we were in the middle of the channel. Uh, we were to one side. I thought we were still in the marked yeah. channel. It, it goes around the curve, and so as we were going through, we touched, and the boat started to do this on one side. Uh, since we have a displacement hull, the front of the boat's lower, so it touched, and we did hurt nothing, just, mm -hmm. just turned to the right and everything and in off. the keys is sand, anyway. Yeah. Well... So. Yeah, there it was. Mostly. like there, There's definitely yeah. some coral and some rocks, but where that was. Um, and and then, then we touched over here when it was real low tide, but in the middle of the channel. We were in the channel, and I'm pretty sure I'd nail a lobster pot with my propeller and just chop that actual pot, not the buoy, because yeah. um, it was super, super low tide, and um, we need four feet, and we were saying it was saying it was 3.8. Uh, and then the other spot, of course, was down in Stock Island when we were anchoring. That wasn't really running ground so much as we were anchored and the, the wind Swung. shifted and we we touched bottom. It, didn't, it wasn't like a, uh, a hard grounding. Nothing we've done has really been a yeah. hard grounding, th knock on wood. It's uh, Well, but what do you say? Everyone always says... There's two types of boaters yeah. in the Keys. Those that have run aground and those that have lied about it. So, we're not lying about it, but... Let us know if you've run aground and where you've done that. Um, question number two was number two was from Heather Hurt Photography on Instagram. She's got beautiful pictures. We even had her come to the boat and take pictures for us. So if you need any photography, uh, she travels. Um, she asked, how do you prioritize what to keep and what to get rid of? So I think she's in, referring to when we lived in the house and then moved aboard. How do we prioritize what to keep and what to get rid of? So I gave each of the boys two boxes. They weren't little, yeah. um, but two boxes. One box was of clothes and bed stuff and stuffed animals and whatever it is that you wanted to keep for sleeping and clothing. And the other box was toys. All you got was in here. It included your arts and crafts, your Legos, whatever. So each boy did that. And so moving aboard, they had that. That's how I did the kids. That was probably the hard one, is the kids. Yeah. Uh, to me, everything else was easy. If it didn't fit and uh, it wasn't necessary, mm -hmm. it doesn't go on the boat. I mean, right. we don't have a lot of room for luxury or extra not needed stuff. Which is kind of nice. Uh, we can go to Target and I walk around and I'm like, dang, that's cute. I don't need it. I have nowhere to put it. it. So it saves us on our Target bill. Well, and then it's a process, too. We started by selling the house and everything had to fit in a... U-Haul trailer. We picked mm -hmm. a size trailer and we said, we got to make it all fit in there. Mm -hmm. And then we thought we knew, and then we moved aboard, and we probably took two Suburban loads full of stuff to Salvation Army just because we didn't have a need for it. Mm -hmm. And we, really more than that, we couldn't find a spot for it. Mm -hmm. And then after living on the boat for several months, we did another load because we're like, okay, this act we thought we would use this, we thought this was a, a need, and it's not. So it just... Over time, you figure it out. Yeah, things like, to be specific, things like our winter sleeping bags. Oh. They don't need them. Um, some warm clothes. I have one or two long sleeve shirts, a sweatshirt, 
That's all I need. Yeah. And then things I wish I had kept. Mm -hmm. I wish I had kept my keyboard. That's one thing I wish I had kept. Yeah. Well, we, as we're moving, that one really didn't fit in the uh, in the yeah. U-Haul, so that's that's yeah. kind of why that one went. What is something you wish you kept? Um, I think I've done pretty tools? good. To be honest. Tools? I kept all the tools I was pretty sure I would need. Um, I even brought a few that I probably don't need. Okay. But uh, I was I did I, I sold a lot of I mean I I wish I the problem with tools is they take up so much space. Uh, the bigger tools I wish I had the table saw. Uh, just I just know where to store it. So unless we end up somewhere and have a little, you know, shop. little shed somewhere that I can turn into a little shop, that's the only reason I'd get big power tools again. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, so this will be our last question for this video, and then we'll answer. If I didn't get to your question this week, we'll get to it next week. Uh, number three from Ingrid Garad, I think I'm saying that right, from Facebook. She asked, what has surprised you the most living on a boat? I don't know. What surprised you the most? Um, how easy it was, a transition. Like, I really thought it'd be harder to transition uh, the kids and the family, and yeah, everybody well, but, just was so resilient. Mentally, we were prepping for Break, years yeah. to do this. Um, and we watched everyone else's you know videos, and so we, we got a good idea as to what was coming. I also think I was actually more surprised not living on a boat, but just islands are small town. Y'all, we don't even have a Walmart. There's nothing here. It's just small town. I think that surprised me the most. Yeah, as far as the living on the boat, um, I mean, there was a lot of projects to do. I think the biggest shock for me is actually how much everything really does cost. That's probably it. Oh, well, let me comes, insert an eye roll, yes. When it comes to the boat stuff, and I do all of our own work, and it's still expensive uh, to purchase mm -hmm. things, so... Yeah. Uh, that would probably be the biggest... Yeah. We're like, oh, it'll be, you know, 10 grand, and you're just, you know, well, no, that's, that's 30 grand. And then, uh, and the, the worst or the biggest expense has got to be if you ever had to hire someone else as their hourly, because um, you got to buy the materials or the part no matter what. Mm -hmm. Plus or minus a couple hundred dollars is one thing, but, you know, a couple hours versus 12 hours of someone's time at a hundred plus dollars an hour, that's thousands of dollars right there, so. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we will get to the rest of your questions in future weeks. We appreciate you guys watching. Yep. If you would please hit the subscribe button, uh, share it with your friends, like the video, and leave us a comment. Yep. We'll, those, we'll, keep, we'll, sorry. Ahead. Keep those questions coming. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Bye. We lost him. Come on, hug us. I'll get him. There he is. Oh.